Okay, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you might be in the world. This is Coach Brad, and this is the Be Well, Be Safe, Be Happy, Eat Ice Cream podcast. I'm just going to jump right into it today because we have got a super exciting guest. Uh, His name is Liam Naden, and he's actually coming us to us today from France. And I'm going to, I'm going to read his bio real quick. And cause I just want to get into this. There's a ton of good questions I want to ask him to learn all about this idea of neurostate rebalancing as he calls it and how we use our mind to literally create the life that we want. So let me read his bio real quick and then we're going to get into this. So Liam is a speaker, teacher, writer, and researcher, and he helps you to understand the process for creating true success in your life by understanding understanding how to use your brain the right way, overcoming your problems, achieving your goals, and ending frustrations. He is also the author of the book, Rebalancing Your Brain for Success, and creator of the Neurostate Rebalancing, a process which automatically gets your brain working the right way to bring you the life that you want. Liam, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, Brad, thanks very much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I have goosebumps. I don't know if you can see through my shirt here, but I'm just <laughs> tickled, tickled to, ex- so excited to speak with you about how we use our brain and this idea of neurostate rebalancing and, and to have you on, on the podcast today. So Liam, I, we talked off camera a little bit. I'm just going to jump right into this. You've got a ton of good questions. So we're going to start right with your life and your story. I know you've kind of had some rags to riches uh, type things going on. But the first question I want to get into from your own life, how did you discover the secrets of true success? Right. Well, it's a big uh, claim to make, isn't it? But, it, uh, it is, but it's an exciting one too. Well, I guess the thing is, like many people and most of your listeners, most of my life I've been very driven. There's been something inside of me that's driven me to want to be successful. Okay. And I've always, you know, been a seeker of how can I be how can I be successful? How can I have a happy, successful, abundant life? And it really started off, and I went through a whole process of, of, diff- of trying different things. And it started off when I was a child. I was brought up in a religious family. Okay. And I was told by the, everybody I respected and knew, my teachers, my parents, the people in the church, if you want to be happy and successful, what you need to do is ask God for what you want. Pray for what you want, and God will give you what you want. I've heard that, yeah. Yeah. So I took that very seriously, and I really worked hard at, uh, at religion. To, I prayed a lot as a child and as a teenager and as I was a young adult, and I really took you know, what the church was teaching very seriously. But what I noticed was <clears throat> a lot of the time I didn't get what I wanted. In fact, most of the time I didn't. And I looked around at my parents, my teachers, and, and the people I knew, and I thought, these people, are they getting what they want because they don't seem to be any happier or more successful than anyone else. And I certainly didn't feel happy or successful particularly, and I had lots of problems. So I thought, maybe this isn't the answer. It's certainly not doing it for me, and it, it didn't appear to be doing it really for other people as well. So then I was told by my parents, well, if you really want a successful life, you need to get an education oh, because the more the you know... You know, the more you know, then you're going to earn more money, and and that's the key to getting on in life. So I said, all right, I'm going to try that. And so I went to university for seven years, amassed a whole pile of degrees, and became an expert in, it was actually in music. Oh, wow. uh, But then I thought, you know, is this making me any happier? Am I any closer to feeling successful? And again, I looked at my professors and my teachers and other people, I thought, you know, these are these are knowledgeable people, but they've still got problems. They've and they don't seem particularly happy and successful. So I thought, well, this isn't really, if I'm honest, the answer either. And then I moved into, I heard from somebody or picked up on the idea: have your own business, set up a business, make a lot of money, and you'll be really happy and successful. So that's the path I went down. And I didn't just set up a business; I really studied business and I did courses and read lots of books and on marketing and everything to do with business. And I was very successful and I did have make money and I was doing things that I really enjoyed doing and that, and that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to do, but I didn't really feel any more successful. And not only that, I wasn't achieving all of the goals that I set for myself, but the worst part of it was I still had lots of problems and stress. In fact, stress 
and problems seem to be the name of the game <laughs> for mm. being in business. And I thought, you know, is this worth it? And um, I thought, this is, you know, th there's got to be more to this. How can I get rid of all stress and problems in my life? You know, surely they're not a natural part of just being successful. So then I moved into, I got hooked on um, personal development and self improvement. Mm -hmm. And I did courses and seminars around. I went to your country and, and did firewalk seminars and all sorts of things. And I read books and I really took this stuff seriously. And I, whatever the particular coach or, or the person teaching a particular method or, or whatever said, I really applied that. I really studied these things, all sorts of things from NLP and, you know, many of the well known techniques. Mm -hmm. But as I went to the seminars, I noticed a couple of things. One is I wasn't any happier. I wasn't any more successful. I still had all these problems to deal with and, and stress in my life. And I looked at the people there and no judgment on other people, but it's an observation. People didn't seem particularly more successful than the general population either. So I thought maybe there's, a, there's something missing here. You know, this isn't really doing it for me. This isn't the answer. So then I went into spirituality. And I thought, you know, read about the law of attraction. And I heard, well, you know, you don't work hard. Um, you attract you from the way you are. So I, I really studied spirituality in a big way. And I learned meditation and I became a vegan. And I did all sorts of lifestyle changes. And I studied all sorts of different, you know, teachers who were teaching spiritual practices. And again, I noticed, you know, if I'm really honest, I've still got problems. I've still got stress. Um, I don't really feel that true fulfillment that I'm seeking. And again, I noticed that the other people who were practicing these things as well, they were no different to me. So I thought, you know, maybe success, sorry, maybe stress is a natural part of life. Maybe everything I've read is right, that life is hard. You're supposed to struggle. There's, a good, there's good things about struggle. Struggle is good. Maybe this is all true. Maybe just this idea of having a life where you really feel fulfilled, in the flow, dynamic, and without having to deal with stress and problems that come along all the time. Maybe that's just a, an idea that's totally unrealistic. But as I was going through this, something really interesting happened to me, and it should never have happened because I, by this stage, and I was in my 40s, I was an expert on success. I knew, you know, if you want to know about goal setting and all, you know, meditation or uh, hypnosis, um, using affirmations, reprogramming your subconscious mind, changing your beliefs, doing all these things. You know, I knew all this stuff. So what happened to me, though, was I lost everything. And suddenly I was homeless, penniless. I had no prospects. I had nowhere to go. I, I ended up moving in with my elderly mother and sleeping on her couch in her little apartment. And here I was, and I thought, why has this happened to me? I, this should never happen. I know everything about success and being in control of your life and what to do to, to um, achieve goals, theoretically. So why has this happened to me? And, you know, I went through this period of real stress, obviously, unraveling and getting back on my feet, unraveling all the mess, having people phoning me for money, you know, and nearly went bankrupt and all of these things. But, so, but things gradually got better, and after a few months, things got an awful lot better. And then my life started to go in a completely different direction. And what I noticed was happening to me was it was completely different to what had been in my previous life because suddenly business opportunities were coming to me to do things that I really loved doing and making money that I, to allow me to do other things that I really loved doing. I attracted a great relationship that was completely unlike the, the stressful relationships I'd had before. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I was starting to do all the things, not only that I really had always wanted to do, but things that I'd never thought of that I wanted to do that were really great. And the best part of all was I didn't seem to have any problems or stress. Life seemed to be flowing in a completely, wouldn't say effortless, but struggle-free way. And I know it sounds really weird to say, oh, you're just saying it. you didn't have problems and stress, but I really didn't, and I still don't, if I'm really honest. 
And one of the things I started to do was I got into marriage and relationship coaching, and I still do a lot of that, helping people overcome the problems in their relationships. And I'm very proud of the material that I provide for people. But the thing that puzzled me is why was it that some people were able to achieve their goal of saving their marriage from divorce, which was really the problem that they came to me with, mm -hmm. and other people didn't? Mm -hmm. And I noticed it was the same thing. It wasn't anything to do with religion or prayer. Some people would say to me, look, I pray every day for to save, heal my marriage, and it didn't happen, and other people didn't pray at all, and, and they did heal their marriage. Mm. It wasn't anything to do with motivation or knowledge because people were very motivated. And they, a lot of people came to me with a, a lot of knowledge about relationships and what to do and what not to do. That didn't seem to be a factor either. And when I sort of reverse engineered, or, if you like, or tried to figure out what was the difference between what pe people's results that were actually where they got their, the results they wanted and when they didn't, and how did that relate to me? I was now getting all the results I really wanted, even though I'd spent a lifetime struggling and trying to figure out and really working hard at creating this success. This new approach seemed to be the answer. It seemed to give me the results that, I, that I'd been looking for. And when I really dug deep into this, and tried to analyze what had happened to me or what was going on with me and what was going and then I could apply it to the people I was working with. I found something that really shocked me, to be honest, because it was so obvious. And it's actually something that's been taught throughout every religion, every spiritual practice, every personal growth practice to some degree. But we've all been interpreting it the wrong way. And it comes down to using something which happens to be simply a machine. It's the most powerful machine that's ever that exists in the universe, but it is a machine, and that's our our human brain. Okay. And the really weird thing was, is what I could, what I figured out, and and I I picked this up with research into science, you know, um, physiology of the brain. There there was lots of research that's gone into this. Not many people have made the connection between brain physiology <clears throat> and psychology. And I, I, I really worked out what was actually a remarkably simple um, theory, if you like, or, or explanation of how we as human beings work. But I really, what I really realized was we have this machine between our ears, which is the most powerful computer that, that, that exists in the universe. It's infinitely more powerful than any computer on Earth. In fact, they did an experiment a few years ago where they got the brain and, a, and the one of the world's most powerful supercomputers to do the same process. And it took the human brain one second to do the process and it took the computer 40 minutes to okay. do the process. So we have no concept, no idea of what we've got as a computer, but it is a machine. And the really interesting thing I discovered is the reason we have problems, in, if you think about any machine, if you use it the wrong way, what's going to happen? You're going to have problems. And you're not going to blame the machine and say there's something wrong with it. You say, well, it's being used the wrong way. And that's why there's a problem with it. If you think about your car, you know, if you want to go from point A to point B, you know, you get in the car and you go, I'm, this is my destination. Now, what do I need to do to get there? Well, I need to put the right fuel into the car to right. start with. And I need to press all the levers and pull the, the handles and, and, and press the buttons in the right order, in the right sequence. Now, if I do that, I'll have a really smooth ride and I'll get to my destination and it'll be really pleasurable. But if I don't do that, say if I keep the handbrake on or press down on, on the brake, the foot brake, trying to, and, try, and wondering why it doesn't move. And if I, don't, if I don't do things the right way, if I don't use that machine correctly, what's going to happen? You're probably not going to go anywhere. But if you do go anywhere, it's going to be a real struggle and things are going to go wrong you know, with the, with yeah. the machine. Yeah. So it's exactly the same with the human brain. The human brain, for all of its infinite capacity, at the end of, it, end of the day, it's a machine. And if you know how to use it the right way, it creates you. It, it does its job, its biological job, which is to give you the life of being the best that you can be. Because here's something else interesting. You know, one question I ask myself is, who am I? You know, we all ask, we probably, a lot of us ask that question. But Common you know, question, yeah. when you 
when you're going through struggle and, and bad times, you go, what the hell's going on? What, you know, who, <laughs> who, who am I? Right. Why, why is this happening to me? Right. And I went on a quest and, you know, we can, we've all got different ideas of who we are, but there's something really interesting that we can all agree on. We might disagree about a lot of things about who we are, but one thing we can agree on is that we have a physical body and we exist in a physical world. Mm-hmm. So we're a, we're a biological entity and we have in common with every other biological species on the planet, a purpose for being here biologically. And if you were to ask any biologist scientists, what is the purpose of human life? He would say, there's only one purpose of human life, and that is to create more life. So on a physical level, you're designed to be able to reproduce and, or to, to do, play your part in carrying on the species. Mm-hmm. That's the biological purpose we have. So if you accept that, there's a couple of things that come out of it. One is your greatest chance of survival and, and doing that is by being your best. It's by not having problems. It's by being your healthiest, your happiest, because when you're at your happiest, you're, you're most creative, you're most resourceful, you're bit most able to deal with challenges and create a great life, and therefore you have the greatest chance of survival. So it's actually a biological purpose for you to be happy and for you to be the best that you can be. And it's not a biological purpose for you to have problems. Because when you think about what problems are, there's nothing good about problems. And I know we talk about, oh, you know, they make you stronger and all of that, Mm. but it's actually not true. Problems make you weaker. When you're stressed, it has a direct effect on your body and on your mind and your ability to perform, and it breaks down the body. It's what causes disease and, and, you know, bad health is stress and problems. So there's actually nothing good about a problem. Having one, they, they only harm you. So they can't be natural. It can't be natural for you to have problems because biologically you're supposed to be your best. So when I realized that, and again, this is backed up by, by science. It's not just me coming up with a theory, but sure, when sure. I, I discovered that, what the other thing I discovered is, well, wouldn't it make sense that if you're biologically set up to be the best you can be, if that's your wiring, wouldn't you something in your body designed to, to keep you on that track to make sure that you in other words, wouldn't you have some tools and resources within you to make you the best that you can be and to bring that out in you? And it turns out we do. And it's this thing. It's the human brain. That is your machine whose sole function is not only to keep you alive, but to make sure you're the best you can be. And if you allow it to a job, it's going to make sure that you don't have problems. It's going to make, it's going to make sure you make the best decisions. Okay. It's going to do its job to keep you happy, healthy, and your best. Okay. So for folks listening, I, I want to reiterate. So if, if you're interested in learning more, because I only have so much time with Liam, his book, Rebalancing mm-hmm. Your Brain for Success, uh, you can find this at his website, liamnaden.com. I'll put a link to that in my podcast description. Uh, so Liam, I'm, I'm dying to know. I'm curious. I'm sure everybody's dying to know. You have this machine, your brain between your two ears. How do we use it then to create this, this life of, of happiness and health and, and success and everything that you're talking about? Okay. And I, I'm sorry if I'm going on a bit. I, no, actually have my own, I actually have a podcast called Using Your Brain for Success as well. And I go into a lot of detail about all of this. So okay. if people are interested, they can get the full story in the background okay. there. Okay. But, we'll check that essentially, out too. Yeah. Essentially what happens, your brain has four parts. These are all physical parts. They're not just, you know, eerie fairy things. You have a thinking brain. So I'm just breaking it down really simply, which is where all your thoughts, um, all the information that you get is stored, your thinking brain. Then you have an emotional brain, which is responsible for creating your feelings, whether they're good or bad. Then you have what I call a mechanical brain, and that takes care of all of the non-thinking, the automatic functions in your that keep you alive, you know, your breathing your heartbeat, your digestion, and the the functioning of all your organs. And it's also the place where you have a really important tool, and that's your fight or flight. You might have heard that, your Mm. your fear response mechanism. Mm -hmm. That comes from your mechanical brain. And I'll talk about that in a second because that is crucial to understanding how your brain works because we're all doing it wrong. Everyone's doing it wrong. Okay. Okay. And that's why we've all everyone's got problems. But there's a fourth part of your brain, which is your creative brain. And that's not where your comes from. It's not where your thoughts come from. 
It's a different part, and the um, researchers have recently uncovered where this is located in the brain. It's right in the middle of your head. And what this is responsible for, this, this gives you intuition, gut feelings, aha moments, creative ideas on better ways to do things, and, and it's where your resources come from. And it's where you get ideas that you that don't relate to anything you've ever had through your thoughts, you know, what you've experienced, but you come up with something completely new. And all our great artists, musicians, um, even athletes have described this part of the brain as where their creative creativity comes from. Writers, they go, I don't know where this came from. It came from somewhere. And we've all got this in us, this creative ability. We all have those aha moments. And we also have those feelings of, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. And we still go ahead and do it. So that's, but the point about these four parts of your brain is, the way you're supposed to live is you're supposed to be driven by your creative brain, you know, because that's the part that not only tells you the right things to do and how to fix problems if you encounter them and how to avoid problems, which is an even bigger, more important issue. But it, funnily enough, remember we're talking about an infinitely powerful machine. It's also the thing that brings you coincidences, chance events, quote unquote, okay. synchronicities. I mean, there's no, there's no accidents in this universe. Everything's absolutely ordered. And what you think is a chance event is part of your creative brain bringing to you the best that you need in your environment for you to express yourself at your best. But here's the thing. So what you need to do, if you want to live at your best, you need to activate your creative brain and you need to live in that state. And that is our natural state of living. And it's sometimes described as being in the zone, in the flow, you know, people talk about this when they're feeling creative. When you're feeling love, when you're feeling gratitude, when you're feeling good, you are in this natural creative state. And your brain is bringing to you all of the, the resources you need to, to live the life you're supposed to live, being the best you can be. But here's the thing. There's one um, time when that is not appropriate for you to live like that, when you're, when you're not supposed to be in the flow. And that is when you're presented with an immediate danger to your survival. So, you, you know, if you go back to um, prehistoric times, you know, mm -hmm. you see a lion rushing at you out of the jungle or you hear a snake in the grass. So the brain has a different function there. It's called your fight or flight response to deal with an immediate threat to your survival. And what happens when that's activated is, say the lion comes running towards you, you're a part of your brain, it's actually in your emotional brain, decides that that is a danger for you, and it activates feelings of fear, anxiety, stress, and that kicks in your, your fight or flight response to react and deal with that danger. But your creative brain gets blocked off at that point because it's of no use to you. You know, your creative brain is no use when you're faced with a, a, a life or death situation. Because when you think about it, if a lion's running at you, you don't want to be sitting there going, looking at all of the nice flowers and going, oh, this is beautiful, this forest. And, oh, it's lovely, the breeze on my skin. And, and maybe what I should do is sit down and, and write and think through um, a, a strategy to deal with this danger, this lion coming towards me and figure out what I should do. All of that gets shut off because it's not only unnecessary, but it's life-threatening. You know, you, had, you don't have time to, <clears throat> it's, you, you'd be dead if you, if, you're, if you started to think what to do. And this is what it's designed to do. It's, it's designed to shut down your creativity, shut down your, um, any, your natural state and to react instantly without thinking to that danger. But here's the thing. Most people are living in a state of fear and anxiety where that fight or flight response yeah. is activated all the time. And, and what happens in that state? Your creativity is shut down. Your awareness is shut down. Your ability to see the big picture is shut down. So let me let me let me jump. In, things that, yeah, let me jump in real quick. Yeah. Liam, I'm sorry. So that you bring up a good point. Yeah, a lot of us do live in this fear and anxiety. One of the the questions I wanted to ask you is how do you eliminate that fear uh, and anxiety from your life then, or what you say? How do you eliminate <laughs> fear and stress in in an uncertain world? So how how do you kind of turn that off and have your creative brain working working all the time then? Well, this is the trick, and this is what I teach through neurostate rebalancing, which is you 
as you mentioned earlier on, really what that is is a process to get you living in your natural creation. All that's really happening is your brain is <clears throat> sending out messages telling you that you're in danger. That's all that it, you might even think you are, and you're thinking, why am I afraid and why do I feel all stressed when I when I hear hear these things or when you know when I think about something? And you don't even know what, but it's and your brain is just using its machine to because it's somehow interpreted what message or whatever you're looking at or thinking about is dangerous to you. It's going to activate your fear. And you know, one of the things that happens when you're afraid, when this is activated, is you automatically own your brain can only see what's negative in your environment. Now that makes total sense when you're seeing when you hear a snake in the grass because you want to you, your brain is going what other dangers what other dangers are there is there another danger is there another threat but if you live like that what it shuts down is your ability to see the picture and this is why so many people are, are just focused their brain is just getting them to focus on the negative all the time they can't see the big picture and one of the ways you know about this is and I'm sure you've had this experience yourself but you know. Everybody will have had this experience. You have a friend who's got a problem. Maybe you know somebody who's having a rough time in their relationship. And they tell you, oh, you know, I've got all these problems and my husband eats this, that, and the other, and, you know, I don't know how to fix it. And, and you can see clearly what the answer is. You say, I know what you should do. You should just leave the guy. Right. Go and find someone better. You know, you don't need to put up with that or whatever the answer is. But you can see that really clearly. And th their response to you is, oh, no, that, that's not the answer. I can't. No, no. And it's not because they're being difficult. Their brain is blocking out their ability to see the big picture. Their brain is only keeping them in reactive mode. So it's like, well, let's go to, no, I'll go to counseling. I'll try harder. I'll be nice. I'll, you know, they're doing all the wrong things to heal that relationship or even to heal their life. But it's because their brain is, cannot, can't see all of that. It can't see the big picture. So when you realize all of this, you realize that fear is your enemy. You've got to find a way to eliminate fear from your life, except when there really is a danger. But the stuff you watch on the news on TV, that's not a threat to your survival. And, you know, even if it was, the real big picture, the real awareness, is, the real fear is a fear of death. How irrational is that? We're infinite beings. Why do we have a fear of death? You know, there've been more than 10,000 documented cases of people who've been through near-death experiences who've died and then come back to life, you know, from the doctors resuscitating. Nearly every, they all say the same story and they all say the same thing to the doctor when they come back, which is, why did you bring me back? Yeah. It was so much better over there. Yeah, yeah, you know? I've heard that, yeah. So, but we don't have this awareness when we're in a fear state because our brain is saying everything is danger. You've got to protect yourself. You've got to react. You've got to do all this. So the key to getting out of it is firstly to realize how your brain works and that your enemy is fear. Fear is stopping you from not only seeing the truth <clears throat> about every, anything and it's making you to see the negative and more negative about anything, but it's also stopping you from being resourceful to solve any problem you might have. So, and this is when you're stressed and anxious. And this is what I realized when in my previous life, I was trying to force things and I was stressed and, you know, I'm going to make, I'm going to do all this and struggle. And I was making bad decisions. And not all the time, but I did make a lot of bad decisions. And then you spend all this time trying to undo things that you should never have done in the first place. You know, you employ the wrong people in your business or you, you do the wrong business deals or all sorts of things. And it makes for a lot of problems and stress. And the difference between that and my new life was I learned how to get rid of fear and realize that the things that had been, that had been driving me all my life to try and be successful were based on fear. I was afraid that if I didn't um, get more, then I would have a bad life. You know, the two things I was afraid of, actually, I realized, was one, having nothing. So that drove me to try and make more and more money because when you're afraid of having nothing, you've always got that fear. It doesn't matter if you've got $100 million, you're still afraid of losing it if you've got that fear. And the other thing I was afraid of was not being loved. But when I ended up having nothing and not being loved, <clears throat> my brain said, nothing to be afraid of here. You're still, still around. Life's not too bad, is it? So you don't need to be afraid of it anymore. And so when fear's not driving your life, you, your brain starts bringing you the stuff the good stuff, 
that you always wanted and, that, and stuff that you didn't even know you wanted. So the first thing is to understand that your brain is a machine. Fear is, is, the, is the enemy. It's what causes the problems in your life because it's shutting down your brain's ability to give you <clears throat> a resourceful, the best life that you're supposed to have. So when you understand that, you've got to really start working on your fear. And through neurostate rebalancing, I've got a process showing people how to do this because you've got to reteach your brain to say that what you thought you were afraid of isn't anything to be afraid of at all. And you can't really do that through affirmations or just because what affirmations often are is you're repeating a lie to yourself. You're going, I am rich, I am happy, I'm whatever. No, I'm not. You know, that's what actually the message you're giving to your brain. You're trying to convince yourself. But that comes from a place of fear as well, because you're saying, no, I'm not, but I want to be. You know, so you're struggling. And when you put in all this effort and all this struggle and you try and think, think things through and all these things, it's all based on fear. So you're not using the full resources of your brain to actually solve, solve your problems and make sure you go in the right direction to minimize or eliminate problems in the future. So it's really about changing your brain's interpretation of your environment, if you like. And actually, one of the key things um, to do <clears throat> on that is, you know, you've really got to control what you, the fuel that you put into your body. Now, we all know you need to, if you put in bad food into your body, you're going to get sick. You know, if you eat junk food all your life, you, you're going to get heart problems and you're going to get sick. But fewer of us realize that the same goes for mental fuel as well. If you put negative ideas into your brain, you're going to get sick because it's going to keep you in the state. There's actually a scientific term, term for the state. It's activating your sympathetic nervous system. Your sympathetic nervous system is your fight, flight, limited awareness, shut down state where you react. And you have total control over that. And, you know, it always astounds me, to be honest, why people watch mainstream media, why, why they watch the news. Because for a start, how do you know it's true anyway? And you know, if you are going to get some, some information, why not get it from somewhere independent? Seek out an expert on what, what they're talking about and ask them what's going on. But secondly, it just makes you feel bad. And if you realize the name of the game, the trick is to make sure you control what goes into you because you've got to have a wall between what between you and what could make you feel bad. And I know that sounds um, sort of ruthless or, you know, harsh, but it, and, and people say we've got to be realistic. It, that is being realistic. You create your own reality based on your, how you're using your brain. So you've really got to be ruthless and say, I've got to be very mindful of what I'm putting, just as I do about what I put into my body if I want to be helpful, healthy. I've got to be mindful about what, what I'm putting into my brain because if that's making me feel fear, worry, anxiety, doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter how real you think it is because you think it's real when you're in a negative state. But when you get out of that negative state, the truth starts to appear. When you, when you become more aware, the truth of what is actually around you and in your life will appear to you. And you look, then you look at it in a completely different way and say, why, why did I even bother looking at all that stuff? It just doesn't seem to be relevant. And again, most people think, well, that sounds a bit ridiculous. It only sounds ridiculous because you don't understand that that's how it works. And it does from your own perspective, which is when you're in a state of fear, anxiety and worry, it does sound ridiculous. Yeah. But once you understand that, that you've got to have a war on against fear, you've got to try and stop anything coming into your life that's going to make you feel bad. Because when you feel bad, you've lost the game. You can't, you're not using your full resources your brain can't do its job, and you're going to have problems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the book again is rebalancing your brain for success. Uh, Liam he teaches the program Neurostate Rebalancing. Again, if you're interested in learning more how to rebalance your brain to create this life of success that Liam has been talking about, certainly check out his programs. His website is liamnaden.com. Uh, you can also find his podcasts on there. Uh, Liam, you said one of your podcasts was unlocking your brain for success. Using your brain for success. Using your brain for <laughs> success. Okay. I'm definitely going to check yeah. that out. So yeah, definitely. If you're listening now, check, this is some, some exciting stuff. Uh, Liam, I want to ask you a couple more questions, but one of the ones you had on here, uh, 
what is the easiest and quickest way to solve any problem in my life? Really what I was, what I was saying, which is to, to get rid of fear. Get rid of fear. <clears throat> yeah. Just, just a, I mean, I've been going on a bit and I could go on for hours about this and I'm trying to condense yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I see if that, people, yeah. <laughs> if, people, if people think this is a bit of a, a weird idea, just think about what's in the Bible. You know, what does it say in the Bible? Well, someone's actually counted that how many times it says this phrase in the Bible, and it's more than 300 times. It says in the Bible, be not afraid. Oh. Have faith, be afraid. Now, they're not saying that it's some fancy idea. That's because you can't function properly when you're afraid, you know? And it also says in the Bible, give no thought to tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Be like little children. What are little children like? They're not afraid and worried and stressed and trying to figure out what their goals are. They're living in the moment and just enjoying what's, what's coming to them. Be like little children, but for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, you will be looked after. Again, it says in the Bible, you know, the, the, the flowers on the, I can't remember the exact quote, but the flowers, look how beautiful they are. How much more do you think you will be looked after? So these are all instructions about how to use your brain the right way. They're not just nice ideas. Right. And it's told to us over and over. And in other religions as well, what, the, what the, the books are saying is this is how you're supposed to live. You're su the, the way you function best as a human being is not in a state of fear. It's in a state of trust, allowing, and then once you start doing that, things really change and it sort of snowballs. You can go, wow, this really, this is the way to live. This is actually, you know, things working out great in my life. But you have to, you have to sort of get over a bit of a hump because it does require a bit of trust because none of this is coming from your thinking brain. Because your thinking brain is all trying to figure out how all this stuff works. Mm -hmm. But your creative brain already knows the answers. So you just, let, you just sit back and you see what shows up. I know it sounds weird, but when you trust amazing stuff, and I know this from personal experience, amazing stuff shows up completely out of the blue. You know, and you think, oh, I'm, I don't think I've got to bother making any plans anymore because much better things are showing up all the time. Yeah, no, I, I get exactly... <laughs> For, for me in my life, no, I, I get exactly what you're talking about. You make a good point that a lot of us, not just in, in my country, but countries around the world are constantly walking around in fear and anxiety and living in this place of fear and this place of stress. And yeah, it does shut down our creative brain, but you're right. We are always trying to figure things out, figure things out. I think like society like says, hey, you got to figure this out. And what you're saying is, hey. We are back on. So, so what I was saying, Liam, um, yeah, a lot of us are walking around in this constant state of, of fear and anxiety. And so what you're saying is really just shut the fear down and, and allow the creative brain to work. It's, it sounds like it's, it's that, that simple. Is that basically what it sums up to be? Absolutely. That is the mechanical creative process or functioning that, you are, that is your natural state. And it is simple actually <clears throat> and the more you understand it and, and more natural you realize it is then the more you're encouraged to say well you know i've got to figure out how to get rid of this fear because it is the only thing that's stopping me it's not what's actually happening to you that's stopping you from getting to where you want to go it's it's the fear that that you think it is is generating that is stopping you from from going where to where you're supposed to go ah. so when you understand that you think you know um, I've got to find a way to get rid of all this fear and stress. And, and one of the things you realize is most, nearly all of the stuff you're afraid of, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to be afraid of it. In fact, what I teach in neurostate rebalancing, one of the parts is to, to really uncover what it is you're truly afraid of, because most people don't even know. They just feel bad. But their brain knows it's got some program, if you like, going or some wiring or you know, it's not, it's not really wiring, but it is a process that is interpreting something as being dangerous. And a lot of this comes down to our conditioning, you know, and, the, and what we keep feeding into our mind in the way of ideas. Because remember, your thinking brain is just a collection of all of the experiences and ideas and information that you've put in there. So if you're feeding it constantly with, you know, about war and disease and, and you know, all these things... That's, uh, it doesn't make it real. It, 
it just make, means that's what your brain is interpreting. It's, it's the, the fuel you put in there. Yeah, no, I like that metaphor. You know, we talk about fueling our bodies with healthy food, but yeah, we got to fuel our minds with healthy thoughts and, and healthy thinking too. Uh, Liam, I'm starting to run out of time, but I want to ask you one more question. Mm-hmm. Again, this is just from your, your bio page there at Podmatch, but uh, is having goals important? And if so, how do you make sure you achieve them? So first, I'm just curious, what's your thoughts? Is having goals important? That first part of the question. I think I know what you're going to say for the second part, but I'll let you answer it. Go, uh, well, I could hours about goals, but yeah. <laughs> there have been books written recently that goals are actually counterproductive, oh. and for many reasons. One is they're usually based on fear. and what, So what you're really saying is, I want to be rich, I want to have all this money, because I'm afra- subconsciously, because I'm afraid that if I'm not, then I won't be happy. Yeah. So when you set goals based on fear, they're going to be the wrong things. And even if you achieve them, they're not going to make you happy. But the second thing is, you can't. You're, that, the problem with that, with setting goals, is you're using your thinking brain to try and figure out what it is that you really want, and not only what you really want, but what you should have for you to be happy. And your thinking brain doesn't know. Your thinking brain can only come up with ideas based on the information that's already in there. So you know, you've read a book or heard of somebody who drives a nice car and they look happy. So your brain says, well, if you have a nice car, you'll be happy but it doesn't know. But your creative brain knows exactly what you need for you, nobody else, for you to be the ultimate best that you can be, happiest, and it's nothing probably about what you think think it is. So instead of sitting there, and I, I used to do that, to sit down and, hmm, what do I want? Oh, well, I want to be rich and I want to go do this and I want to do that. And I realized that's just not the process. It's your, your, you know, you're limiting yourself you know, can you imagine yourself making $100 million or can you imagine yourself living on a beach with nothing? Probably not. Can you imagine yourself living on a yacht cruising around Europe? Probably not. So why limit yourself? Why not allow the part of you that knows what you want to just bring it to you rather than you trying to figure out using a very limited part of your brain, your thinking brain? So I think goals, and, and I'm not the only person to say this, goals are actually can be destructive. Now, there's a type of goal that is beneficial but that's not really a goal it's when you see something and you know you're going to have it and when you think we've had those experience everyone's had that experience probably Mm -hmm. i remember walking into a house and thinking i'm going to buy this house now it was three times the price that i of my budget but i did buy it but there was a part of me that said for some reason i'm i know i am going to buy this house now that's not setting a goal because what happens then is that's your creative brain saying this is what you're going to get and what you do is you just do the things that you know, and sometimes it might be a bit scary, but you things all fall into place, don't they? And a lot of it is not just you. It's like, oh, well, I'm glad that happened. or And it all just, it seems almost effortless getting those sorts of goals. So they're not really goals. But sitting down trying to work out what you want and saying, you know, I'm going to do this and, you know, sit, and I need to do this, um, they're, they're counterproductive. You're, you're limiting yourself. Yeah. No, it's, it's sitting here listening to you, uh, Liam. I, I'm, I'm understanding exactly what you're saying. And, and I would, I've had some other podcasts that I've done just myself. I've said literally the exact same thing you are. I've just used different, different, right. different terminologies, but uh, we're saying right. things. So yeah. again, if you're listening, um, Liam offers a program, it's called Neurostate Rebalancing, uh, this idea of how to rebalance your brain to create this life of success that, of course, everybody dreams about. If you are interested in that, you can certainly learn more at his website, liamnaden.com. And again, I'll put a link to that in my in my podcast description here. Uh, Liam, unfortunately, I'm starting to run out of time, but you offered a lot to our guests here today, to our listeners around the world. Is there anything else that you would like to say to kind of wrap up that maybe you haven't said already? No, not really. I just think it's sad that we've we've never been taught how to use this brain machine mm. in an effective way, you know. And I think we should all learn this. It's not difficult stuff. We've been taught how to drive a car, ride a bike, mm-hmm. cook food, what whatever. We taught how to use machines, but the most powerful machine of all, we seem to think, well, you know, it's, it's something life's supposed to be hard, or we're supposed to have problems, and it just isn't true on a biological emotional, spiritual, any other level. We're not taught in spirit in the Bible that life's supposed to be hard. 
you know? No, so, no. Um, it's, it's, it's a great shame. I and mean, that's what my mission is really to help people to really just understand how easy, if you like, um, how, how your life really can flow along if you let it. Yeah. You know, this podcast I'm doing, this is a, a result of the creative brain within me working. And, and again, I definitely encourage you to go to Liam's website. Uh, he's talking about using your creative brain and I'm almost 50. My, all my listeners know this, but it wasn't until maybe within the last six months or a year that I've really started to understand what you're talking about, uh, Liam, using the creative brain and getting away from, from the fear brain that is, that is controlling so much of our lives. And like you saw in your life, a lot of things just started to happen naturally and show up. You walked into this house and just knew you were going to buy it, even though it was over your budget. This podcast just kind of came out of nowhere. And I just had this, the things I needed just started showing up. I didn't never heard a pod match. I just had, had the guy email me. I woke up one morning and there was the email. And then, you know, I, I run it on the anchor platform. I'd never heard of that. I just woke up and there it was on my phone one day. I was like, wow. So that's wow. the creative brain. Uh, and, and isn't it so much more fun? Yeah. Living that way rather than being stressed and trying to force things. Yeah. Yeah. You, you hit the nail on the head, just like wham out of the park as, as, as an expression that we use here in America. But uh, uh, Liam, I sure appreciate you having, having you on the podcast today. This is, this has been an eye opener for me and I'm excited to, to get this out to everybody. Uh, again, one more time, his book is rebalancing your brain for success. He offers a program. It's called neuro straight neuro state rebalancing or NSR for short uh, Liam Naden.com. Uh, again, definitely check it out. There's some good stuff that you can learn there. So Liam, definitely appreciate you being here today. I always, I always hate this part because we run out of time. We're like almost, I usually run around yeah. 40 minutes, we're almost at 50 <laughs> minutes now. So uh, thank you again so much for being here and appreciate all of you listening to this podcast again today. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there. So again, I truly appreciate you listening. Thank you very much. And as I always say at the end of every podcast, until next time, this is Coach Brad saying, be well, be safe, be happy eat ice cream. Take care, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you next time.